This episode is copyrighted by Grace Salmon and Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. Thank you for visiting with us on Launchpad. This is Launchpad. Welcome to episode 35. We're so excited today to join M. Lee Musgrave, Sir Roy Choudhury, Fred Rutman, and Kirsten G. Shooter. We'll be joining, hopefully, by Fred in just a little bit. But meanwhile, on behalf of Mary Helen Sheriff, the author marketing coach, and myself, we are so glad that you've joined us here on Launchpad. Today, we have these just wonderful black rose writing authors. Today, we'll delight in a contemporary romance thriller, a coming-of-age novel set in India, a memoir of the repeatedly dead, and a novel where an unexplained phenomena might just save all humankind from destruction. I'm so happy to have these three authors join us. We have guests joining us here live on the Bookish Road Trip. If you are here, please feel free to make comments, ask our authors questions. We love having each of our guests with us. So let's just jump right in with Lee Musgrave and tell us about Off Kilter. Off Kilter is the second series in the James Terror Mystery series. It eventually will have a third book, so it'll be a trilogy. And it is set in contemporary Los Angeles in the art community there. And it's a murder mystery that spe- features James Terror, who is an amateur sleuth and also uh, an artist. And also he hosts the PBS uh, program called Cal Arts. Fascinating. Well, we're going to want to hear more about that as we move forward. So, Borna Reichard, hurry. You have written a coming-of-age novel, Everything Here Belongs to You. Tell us about it. Yes. Um, so, it is a story of, you know, love, betrayal, and redemption. It's literary fiction, and it is set in India in a city called Kolkata. And uh, it uh, the story takes place in a house in a you know um, middle class Bengali family where um, Parul and Mohini two girls grow up okay um, but Parul is a maid and Mohini is the employer's daughter so um, you know Mohini's father is a famous weightlifter Mohini's life is secure she has a big house bank balance she's going to go to college but Parul is a maid and she fe- lives a very insecure uh, dark future. She has a very dark future. She doesn't know where her life is going. And every month, Parul's father comes from the village and collects all her wages and takes it with him. So Parul is very frustrated. And she, even though she's very, very close to Mohini and they grow up like sisters, uh, Parul knows that, you know, that her life is very different and she's not going anywhere. So in this very frustrated state, one day she meets um, she meets Rahim, who happens to be a political militant. And uh, she asks Rahim um, to, to teach her the Islamic way because Parul is actually Muslim. And, uh, but Rahim, um, because he has very radical ideas, kind of brainwashes her and wants her to do uh, certain things that she definitely would not have done. So um, meanwhile, an American teenager comes to this house to learn yoga and meditation. And Rahim asks the maid to harm him. And the maid has to make a very, very difficult choice what she's going to do. Is she going to be loyal to the family that has given her a home and she has lived there all her life? Or is she going to betray their family and follow Rahim's orders? So we'll have to hear more about that and the (laughs) suspense that comes with it. We Mm -hmm. haven't had Fred Rutman join us yet, but Fred has written a novel. uh, I'm sorry, it's a memoir called The Summer I Died 20 Times. And Fred is frequently known as Repeatedly Dead Fred. So his memoir we will learn more about um, uh, as we move through today, and hopefully he will be able to join us. Kirsten G. Shooter has written a fiction, Inside Dweller, Genesis. Kirsten, tell us about it. Okay. Well, here's the cover. Beautiful. I love I, the, the we have like an art cover genius at the at the publishing company, and um, well, the book is about a woman who experiences a string of strange phenomenon, and you know 
she does what anyone else does. She writes it off as, um, you know, just she comes up with simple explanations for it because that's what we all do. Until uh, some, she saw an entity that was that she thought she hallucinated in the hospital. It winds up in her home and it attacks her. So she can no longer uh, ignore the fact that something's going on. But when she wakes up, there's no physical evidence of the attack. So then that uh, she em embarks on a journey to figure out what is going on with her. And uh, she obtains the help of a specialist who will help her recover her memories. And their journey kicks off uh, uh, and she must um, find out what's going on to save herself and everyone that she loves. And potentially the world, all of humankind. Mm -hmm. That's right. That, that's a, that is a tall order. <laughs> um, I, I find each of your books are very, very different, but you all have wound up at Black Rose Writing. And uh, Kirsten's already given a shout out to the uh, cover artist. How did you find your way to that particular press? Let's start with you, Lee. Um, that's a good question. Um, really what I decided to do was I uh, didn't want to spend any time trying to get an agent and then have the agent try and find me a publisher. I felt like if I did that, probably a whole year would go by. And I didn't feel like I wanted to do that. So I just went online and looked up publishers who were willing to accept um, uh, applications without an agent. And Black Rose Writing was one of them. And since it was uh, based in Texas and I lived for a little while in Texas when I was growing up as a teenager, um, I felt sort of connected somehow. Uh, and I decided to send the manuscript directly to them. And Saborna, what about yourself? And then Kirsten. Um, well, I actually, in 2015, I met my literary agent. Her name is Julie Stevenson, and she works for MMQL Lit. Um, and Julie uh, loved my book, and she made me, um, she made me edit the book uh, quite a bit. So that editing took uh, at least four years, <laughs> um, you know, because um, the POV was wrong, the structure of the book was wrong, everything had to be changed. And uh, um, I had to get another editor um, to come and help me. And her name is, um, so she, she works for St. Martin's Press. Um, and she gave me a lot of uh, direction and I changed the book and the book was ready and polished and beautiful and ready to go. And then COVID started, okay? And Julie took it to the market when the COVID was at its height and nobody was responding. So, uh, you know, I, I felt like everybody has left New York and there was, you know, complete silence, you know, when my book started to go out to all these um, publishing companies, um, no one was responding. And uh, we, we both were very, very frustrated with the situation. One year went by, nothing, no response. So finally, I started to do some searches and, um, you know, I searched small presses uh, online and Black Rose was one of them. So I sent them my, my um, a manuscript and immediately I heard back from them. And uh, I think one of the comments was, uh, we want all Black Rose writers to learn from your writing, <laughs> something like that. Lovely. I was very flattered. <laughs> very lovely. So, yeah, that's wonderful. how I got it. Wonderful. Kirsten, different books, yeah. different paths. Well, um, I'm actually on the other side of the fence in terms of this discussion. And um, I act as a literary agent. And um, I had some... Uh, authors who had their first novels, even though they were accomplished in other areas, they had really good stories. Um, and one was already an author, but I, I looked at, you know, what Black Rose writing brings to the table and it attracted me because, you know, uh, of the things that they offer, uh, offer. And one thing was, you know, terrific book covers. They were, to me, they really stood out in the industry 
and um, I placed uh, a couple authors with them. And then I submitted my own book since I am also an author. So uh, they, you know, they, they were very responsive and um, supportive and they have been and um, very, very happy with the publisher so far. That's, that's wonderful. I love, you know, part of what we try to do here on Launchpad is to celebrate each of your diverse books, but also help others who are looking for a great read, which I think they could all find here, but also what, how are the paths different? So this is going to be a very interesting perspective. We have comments that are coming in, and uh, one of our Facebook uh, viewers is saying that the mystery series about the art community in L.A. sounds intriguing. Lee, tell us more about Off Kilter. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, well, I've spent most of my life in Los Angeles as a professor of art, an artist, and a curator. Um, and at the same time, I've always loved um, murder mysteries set in Los Angeles, written by Raymond Chandler, for example. Um, I'm so old, Raymond Chandler was still alive when I was a kid. And I was always intrigued by the fact that this man who wrote the book I was holding my hand just lived a few miles away. So anyway, as I grew up, I kept wondering why no one ever wrote about the art community of Los Angeles, because it is immense and greatly to diversify. Finally, uh, I decided, you know, I might as well do this myself. I, since you like reading this so much, Lee, why don't you just write a story about what you know? So I did exactly that. Uh, and most people who read these books tell me that they really enjoy the expose of uh, understanding how the art community in Los Angeles functions. The truth is, I'm sure that that community doesn't function any differently than the art community in New York or Chicago or Paris or Berlin. <laughs> All art communities function pretty much the same way. What's happening in my book is that someone starts killing the leading, the top artist in Los Angeles, and the homicide detective has an old friend who was an art student together with him in college, and he decides he needs help with the art community. He doesn't quite understand the quirkiness of going what's going on in the art community, so he gets his friend to help him solve these murders. Well, and you're an artist yourself, so you know that back of the house so well, don't you? Absolutely. That's the whole point of the movie. The, the um, amateur sleuth is an artist, so he can get the homicide detective in the back door, so to speak, and introduce him to all the movers and shakers in the art community. Um, Kirsten, Lee just mentioned something about write what you know, and I think that each of us is told that as um, an, an author. And your book is um, very different in terms of mm. the paranormal, et cetera. So did you write what you know? Yes, I did. <laughs> so, tell, so tell us more about that. Well, um, yeah, actually, a lot of people ask me, did I make everything up out of my head? What, what decisions can you pass, you know, like, did you make to... Um, you know, include so many paranormal and supernatural elements in your book. And actually, uh, if I if I don't experience it myself, I research it and I, you know, like watch a lot of programs that are more of a documentary style of people's real lived experiences. And um, I like shows that uh, document what's going on. There's a lot of really wild shows that, um, you know, they bring in science, science and yes, uh, Michelle, I, I love paranormal and supernatural too. Uh, and they, they, they try to actually document this stuff now. It's so, so wonderful to see that they're taking so much care to document, you know, stuff that they should have been, you know, like looking into all this time. So it's really nice to see that. And what it, you know, so I wanted to create a book that where people, if they did experience something, they could read and be like, wow, I actually did experience something like that. And everything is based off of like, you know, real science, you know, breaking uh, news about space and everything else. 
And, um, you know, I, I put it together with a lot of lived experiences that I had, um, you know, me and my family, actually. And um, hopefully it'll make a, a real fun book to read. So. so a level of credibility that some more skeptical people will, will find very helpful, I would think. Uh, yeah, well, you know, the book could be written to skeptics and maybe it'll make them think. Um, jo uh, one of John Irving's books did that, that he made me think about uh, God. Is there a God in the universe or are these things that happen only, um, you know, coincidence? And uh, hopefully my book will inspire people to think, you know, is there validity to this? Um, can, can, I, can I examine this? Well, so. I, lo I love that you've done the research on that. So, Borna, let's go to you. Did you write what you know? Tell us your Yes, I did. But I just wanted to mention that how intrigued I am by Christ Christine's description of her book. And I just can't wait to grab one, <laughs> a copy of your book, really. So That's wonderful. But one of our goals on Launchpad is to add to everybody's uh, yeah. to be read pile. Absolutely. So, um, you know, in my book, there are two characters, Parul and Mohini. And as I said, Parul is a maid. She comes to this family when she's only six years old and she comes to this family to work as a maid. Right. So uh, you can you can think of this as child labor because Parul works for this family 24 seven. She has no time to she she goes to a school, but she has no time to do homework. And uh, the mother keeps on telling her, you're just like my daughter, but she makes a clear distinction between Parul and Mohini. Mohini is her own daughter and Parul is a maid. So when I was growing up in India, um, I grew up in a middle-class Bengali household and I saw this, uh, this kind of treatment with my own eyes, right? So uh, little girls from villages will come to work in our house. They will be uh, five, six years old. And my mother always said, oh, you're just like my daughter. You are my daughter, right? But she always made the very clear distinction between me and them. So, uh, you know, these girls, they had separate plates and cups to eat and drink from. They always sat on the floor. They never sat on the, you know, household furniture. Uh, she would send them to a government school, uh, which was free. And for me, I know I went to a private school, English medium school. And my mother always said, oh, don't worry about them. Hmm. Don't worry about them. They are just going to drop out and uh, you have to go to college and you have to study. OK. And uh, also, I remember these girls had separate bathrooms than, you know, what the family members used to use. So, you know, this I think um, I did not think much about it when I was in India. But when I came to the U.S. and I looked at the society from the outside, this child labor thing bothered me a lot that my mother had this had no expectations from this girl. Right. She never thought of sending her to a proper school or giving her a proper education or thought of her future. Um, but for me, you know, she had really great plans and <laughs> great ambition. So I brought that theme into my book. Uh, astounding. I'm going to. Um, echo what Michelle Ann Waite, one of our uh, viewers, is uh, saying. What an experience. Uh, just overwhelming. Um, Fred mm -hmm. is unfortunately not going to join us, so I want to give another plug to his book, though, Fred Rutman, The Summer I Died 20 Times. Uh, that is a memoir told with um, a lot of humor, and obviously he has um, overcome great odds, as uh, Suborna's characters have done as well. Um, Lee, let's go back to you. This is not your first novel. Um, do you want to share uh, about your other work and how that plays into your role as an author? Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, the first two books, uh, Brushed Off and Off Kilter, um, are the same characters in Los Angeles solving additional uh, crimes with uh, the homicide detective. It turns out that it, it will be the the artist, uh, amateur sleuth, the homicide detective, and a woman who um, the artist has had an affair with on the side. She's married. Um, she leaves her husband and moves in with the artist. So the three of them, with a dog named Dewey, his real name is Duchamp, but everybody calls him Dewey. <laughs> so the three people and the dog solve a series of murders in Los Angeles in those two books. 
The third book is um, a fictional historical amateur sleuth murder mystery set in 1912 in Cairo, Egypt, and Berlin. It starts with the uh, discovery of the world famous Nefertiti sculpture bust um, that eventually gets taken to Berlin. Um, primarily because the archaeologist who discovered it is from uh, Berlin and the Berlin Museum um, uh, he is associated with wanted to display it. And surprisingly, at that time in Egypt, uh, artifacts were controlled by the French. And the French looked at everything that was discovered there and um, picked and choose what they thought should stay in Egypt and the rest, they said, the Germans could have. And so uh, the Nefertiti bus, surprisingly, was in the group that this guy said can go to Berlin. Um, and so um, the official photographer, a young Egyptian boy from Cairo, um, gets an opportunity to go to Berlin as well and be a photographer for the German um, Berlin. Uh, museum. I'm hesitating because I you know that one of the problems with these kind of programs is I could spend my entire hour <laughs> <laughs> talking about this book. It's and easy I'm to, to it's, well, that's, cut that's things out so it moves you along a little bit quicker. Make a long story short, in other <laughs> words, this young guy uh, is fascinated by the cultural change that he discovers in Berlin and what he had in Cairo. And um, the girlfriend that he had in Cairo also gets to come to Berlin. She is overwhelmed by the cultural change. Um, and uh, some skullduggery starts off. Uh, some people are uh, stealing and smuggling and copying uh, artifacts from the ancient Egyptians. And a murder occurs. And so the young Egyptian fellow um becomes an amateur sleuth to help solve that murder and actually it's all the women in the story that solve it in the end <laughs> and, and uh, none of none of us on the on this screen would mind that it was the woman who got to do that i'm sure but well. thank you for that <laughs> kirsten i want to come back to you for a minute you your book um has a traumatic um, incident. There is a car accident. Um, and you talked about memory recovery, but you also, one of your characters very much feels like they're losing their mind. Tell, tell us about that path. You're on mute. I'm sorry. Kirsten, you, you're on mute. If you could unmute for us. Well, there you go. <laughs> sorry. No, no. <laughs> That's My husband right. was in the background. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you so much. All right. So, so the losing the mind thing is it causes some great dramatic tension, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. so, right. So pick up from there. <laughs> well, um, you know, that's like a, a lifetime of experience, knowledge, research um, that that went into the book. Um, you know, I, I a, a lot of people you know, poo-poo it these days. But yeah, I really believe that Freud has like a lot of uh, valuable things that are valid to these day, to this day. So that a lot of that went into the book, but also combined with new age, um, you know, that that was an element too that I thought that was important. And, um, you know, again, knowledge, experience, research. I'm a big reader into these things too. So, um, and also uh, one day I was, you know, just giving my daughter a bath and all, all of a sudden, like I just, I had, I had watched a movie, The Fourth Kind. And then for some reason, like, I just got like this sort of like waking day mare dream type of thing. Uh, that that helped me kind of see the connection between the two, and uh, then out came Inside Dweller. So, um, but yeah, that in terms of like um, you know different problems um, like memory loss, uh, you know I've I've 
personally have seen people struggle with it and it gave me a, a realistic sense of um, what's going on. I mean, I do have a, a degree in men mental health counseling. Um, my husband has a PhD in, in psychology. So, uh, you know, I, I, if, if I didn't know something, I had a resource right in the house who was willing to help. So <laughs> that's fabulous. So Borna, you talk about your book as a heart wrenching family drama. Um, you, you've talked about it from the side of privilege, but there's also this incredible side of poverty. What part of your book is that heart wrenching family drama? Well, uh, I mean, if you think of Parul, then uh, she comes to this household when she's only six years old. And, uh, she, you know, whatever wages she earns, her father comes every month and collects those wages from her. And um, he his excuses never end. He always makes some excuse every month, like I have asthma or the house is leaking or I need an extra blanket. And he would say, give me money, give me money, give me more and more money. Right. And uh, Parul was um, very frustrated with the situation and she would run to Ma, you know, the mother of the family and say, Ma, you know, you have to stop my father because what am I? Am I his bank? Am I going to supply him paper notes for the rest of my life? And he doesn't care for me at all. I mean, all he does is take away my money. And Parul had this dream that one day at least you know, her father would find her a groom, would find her a husband. And she would have a family of her own. She would have children of her own. And she won't have to do, you know, run these household chores all the time. But then one day her father comes from the village and says, you know, Parul, I have found a husband for your younger sister. So I am going to arrange a wedding and you are going to pay for it. <laughs> oh, my so, goodness. Yeah. So Parul's last uh, wish, you know, that last, uh, uh, you know, escape was also sealed like she was completely trapped in this situation that she would be her father's bank for the rest of her life and this was her her destiny so this is why she's looking she's desperate and she's looking for a way out and then that's when she goes down and meets uh, a manager of the printing press uh, and asks him to help her Oh, heart-wrenching indeed. Each of your books is on my TBR now. Um, mm -hmm. We just have a very few moments left, so I'd like to hear from each of you. How has writing um, and the release of your books uh, changed who you are? Lee, let's start with you. Wow, changed who I am? That, that, that's a... or, or maybe it hasn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not sure that it has. Uh... <laughs> Uh, especially the first two books, uh, uh, when they were published, uh, a number of my friends and artists uh, who live in Los Angeles read them and contacted me immediately and said, Lee, you know, this passage you wrote on page 43 sounds very similar to what you and I did uh, back uh, yes. in the day. Uh, I feel those two books especially uh, are really about my life. Uh, uh, in Los Angeles, in the art community. Uh, I met with uh, big time collectors, uh, lots of celebrities, uh, art critics, art historians, and when I was curating exhibits all over the place. Uh, and all of that is in those two books. So it's a, a whole side of Los Angeles that you just rarely get exposed to unless you become a part of it. So a platform for you to share your life, but not necessarily changed your life. Kirsten, you've been on both sides, agent, now author. Has your life changed now that you're a published author? Yeah, well, you know, I, I watched my authors as they, um, you know, uh, they went through the process and, you know, they they got their, their covers made and the book design and, you know, it's just it on the other side of the table. It's a completely different feeling. You know, I I got to experience that as you know excitement when I saw uh, Miranda, my main character, on the cover for the first time, and um, having the book go live uh, was you know both thrilling and terrifying at the same time. And um, you know, it's it's just it's added to the fun. I already have a book, um, "Farming Industrial Hemp, Not Your Daddy's Tobacco." I actually won a, an award three months after its publication. 
Um, so, you know, I, that was for nonfiction. I'm actually a very strong nonfiction writer. So having, but having a fiction book just really, um, you know, it was like almost like an entirely different experience. So In, indeed it is. Saborna, last but not least, this is your second novel, but how has becoming an author changed you? We have just a few moments left. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, I, you know, I go to all these book clubs and I meet these wonderful people. And uh, I, when I tell my story, I really feel like uh, there's a soul connection between the readers and the writer and uh, the way they respond, you know, it's heartwarming. And I feel like my message is getting out and it is somehow in some ways touching people. And that is very important to me. And then I'm of course getting all this media exposure. I went on NPR at one point and uh, I'm, I'm less nervous now <laughs> and I'm getting used to this. Uh, but the most important thing is that I wrote, uh, I wrote an entertaining fictional novel which has a message and which talks about injustice. And I wanted people to get that message. And I think it is, it is getting out there. And a lot of people are appreciating the book, reading the book and understanding the book and getting back to me. And that feels very satisfying. That is wonderful. I want to thank each of you and the uh, folks who have joined us live on the show. This has been episode 35 with M. Lee Musgrave, Saborna Roycho, Harry, Fred Rutman, who was unfortunately not able to join us, and Christian G. Shooter. Thanks so much to each of you, and thanks for coming on Launchpad. This episode is copyrighted by Grace Salmon and Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. Thank you for visiting with us on Launchpad.